Hello and welcome to CRC Music in the studio at Cosumnes River College. I'm Omari Tao, Professor of Vocal Music, and today we're delighted to welcome soprano Lucy Fitzgibbon to the program. Ms. Fitzgibbon is a singer, educator, and recording artist who champions work spanning from the Baroque music era to contemporary works by new composers. Her performances have garnered praise throughout the industry and have led to inspiring collaborations and shared programs with composers and artists, including John Harbison, singers like Stephanie Blythe and Don Upshaw. And we'll talk today about one of her newer ventures, Sparks and Wiry Cries. Um, I'll let her tell us a little bit more about her connection to Sacramento and to Cosumnes River College as well later on. Before we uh, welcome her officially to the screen, let's take a listen to Miss Fitzgibbon's performance of Florence Price's Winter Idol. Let's go ahead and watch that video. That is absolutely exquisite. Please, please welcome soprano Lucy Fitzgibbon to CRC Music in the studio. Hello there, Lucy. Hello. How are you? Thank you so much for having me. Oh my gosh, thank you so much for being here. It's uh, absolutely wonderful. It was absolutely gorgeous. 
a really beautiful song, beautiful singing. How are you? Where are you? What's life like in midst post quasi pandemic times? What's going on? Oh, um, I am doing pretty well, thanks. And I hope you are too. <laughs> um, I am actually, excitingly for me, speaking to you from California. Here's yes. some real Californian trees right behind me. I'm here up in um, Arcata, California in the Redwoods because I'm singing tonight and tomorrow night with the Eureka Symphony. Fantastic. Um, and life post COVID this <laughs> spring has just been a real whirlwind. Last weekend I was singing um, in Boston with an orchestra the week before that. I was um, performing a Baroque opera um, in the Finger Lakes. Um, uh, the two weeks before that, my students at Cornell gave a really beautiful performance of music by um, female identifying composers spanning 252 years of history. Um, and um, I premiered a new song cycle by Katie Balch, Catherine Balch, whose mm -hmm. music I think was also just premiered in San Francisco a couple of weeks ago. Um, oh. And I sang with a different orchestra that week, um, some Mahler and Cantaloupe. So anyway, it's just been a little bit nuts. You've been busy, which is good. I guess, uh, I, I guess um, coming out of pandemic, that's kind of the dream that work will actually be there. Yeah. Yeah. right that it will come back and um uh, before i get too far into what you've been doing and uh, can you tell us a little bit about who who that pianist was in uh, the performance we just shared yeah um so one of the people with whom i most love the person with whom i most love collaborating and one of the people with whom i i work quite a lot is um my husband ryan mccullough um mm -hmm. and so actually in that video, and I think in all of the other examples we're gonna be listening today, listening to today, um, I'm getting to perform with him. And our relationship together has been um, both, both musical and personal has been um, a huge part of, I think what has allowed me to feel at home in the music industry. Um, right. you know, I think for all of us finding our support system and, um, and our grounding in, mm -hmm. in a career that can be really demanding is incredibly important. And yeah. not everybody wants to be um, musical partners with their, their life partner, but, and right. that is equally valid. But for me, um, getting to make music with somebody with whom I share everything is um, uh, such a privilege. Yeah. That's fantastic. No, I think it's incredible when you think about partnerships. And there have always been sort of these non uh, non related uh, or personal related uh, duos and, uh, you know, pairings of artists who just they work together so beautifully. And over the years, they just develop that they just go closer and closer together. So that's really extraordinary that you have this um, on an even more personal level. Um, can you tell us you said you were performing um, Tonight, is that right? Tonight, what are you performing on the program? So um, tonight's performance is actually something that was rescheduled from 2020. So I was supposed to be singing out here in I think late April or May of that year and obviously it didn't happen. Um, and at the time the repertoire was a little bit different but because of the various machinations of COVID and, and so forth, it actually turns out that both my husband and I are going to be performing different pieces as soloists with the orchestra. I'm singing a beautiful motet by Handel, Silate Venti, that he wrote in um, 1728. Um, it, I have loved this piece since I first heard it when I was in high school on a CD. Um, <laughs> and um, I, it's just a real thrill to be performing this beautiful piece of music. but. Um, my husband is uh, playing Beethoven's fourth piano concerto, and we're going to give an encore together of actually an, another, I mean, I, assuming that people clap, um, uh -huh. we're going to give a, an encore of another beautiful song by Florence Price, uh -huh. her song Night, which is the first piece of Price's that I ever sang and was my sort of um, that introductory spark that mm -hmm. drew me to her music. So that feels... 
um, particularly special to get to share that song. And, and we picked it um, also in honor of the recent confirmation of Judge Katanji Brown Jackson. And um, mm -hmm. so we're really um, thrilled about that too. Fantastic. Um, I, for those of you who don't know, Florence Price is an African-American um, composer uh, born in 1887, passed in 1953, and is one of those new um, new to most audiences of uh, voices. who has been around, obviously, for a while, but um, an incredible composer herself. Um, whose album recently by, uh, I think it's, I know Yannick Nazet uh, Zagam was the um, conductor, but was it the Met Orchestra? Or who, who? the Philadelphia Orchestra. Philadelphia, sorry, that's right. Philadelphia Orchestra um, just won a Grammy for their recording of her works. And so um, she is very much in vogue. And uh, if you get a chance to hear her work, it's beautiful and, uh, and wonderful. So worth investigating more of her. You also said you just did an opera. What opera and where was this? Oh, so that was a really interesting project. Um, so among the many things that I do, I teach at Cornell University, and uh, one of my colleagues there just recently retired. And at, when they were planning her retirement, they asked her, you know, if she wanted to have a conference or something in her honor. And she said, no, I want to put on a Baroque opera. Um, <laughs> and... My favorite forever. <laughs> I love that. Yes. <laughs> this was another project kind of delayed by the pandemic, but I was really lucky that she allowed me to ask some uh, wonderful colleagues to join me in a performance that combined um, Baroque opera, Baroque dance, and our student orchestra. Um, so it was really wonderful to get to work with some student dancers alongside the professional dancers mm -hmm. and the students playing in the orchestra. And it was sort of a pastiche of three pieces that oh. fit together with within a frame. So we were performing a short, uh, the prologue to Mondonville's Titon et l'Aurore, which is um, an interchange between Cupid and Prometheus um, at a short um, section of Orlandini's Il Giocatore, um, and then the full performance of Dauvergne's Les Trocoeurs, which was a 1753 opera that um, was basically Italian music or music in the Italian style, but written in French to um, appeal uh. to a French speaking audience and make some more money. Um, so it's a really interesting kind of combination of styles at this moment of change. Um, and also was my first um, staged work back since the pandemic started. So um, that was also a real, a real treat. Wonderful. Is that something that you regularly do? You, you seem to be doing a lot of different things, concertizing, recitaling, performing in, in operas. What, what, do you, is this a balanced thing? Is it sort of a constructive thing? You always will do an opera, you will always do, or is it just sort of, uh, you find these opportunities and you're drawn to them? Um, how, what is the balance like of those different areas of, of your um, artistic career? That's a great question. Um, <laughs> I, I try to let things unfold organically, but I have always been interested in, um, the kind of corners and fringes of the repertoire um, and whether that means premiering new works or re-premiering um, bringing <laughs> bringing lost works to light mm. um, and so in in any given season um, it can be hard with a teaching career to do a lot of opera because when i have a contract that takes me away for a long time then I'm not able to maintain that contact with my students. Um, and so I, I, in some ways, made a conscious choice to do a little bit less stage work um, when I committed to making teaching part of my life. Yep. Um, but it is something that I really love. And so when I do have the opportunity, for me, that has often meant maybe I'm doing more contemporary work, um, 
uh, workshopping and premiering new operas where the contract is a little bit shorter. Or, for example, this summer I'm going to be singing um, George Benjamin's chamber opera Into the Little Hill, um, but it's mm. during the summer, so it, it won't take me away. There you go. Exactly. No, you, you're speaking my language. This is, this is my <laughs> story, too. Living on the fringes of the art world and then also, like, how do we balance the teaching and the, um, and the performance? Because I think, I mean, obviously what you're doing is, by exploring and creating is um, so inspirational to your student body, right? Your students get to see you in action and get to experience that and that is extraordinary. Um, so I, I teased in the introduction a bit of your connection, connection to Sacramento and to CRC. Can you tell us a little bit about, about where you came from, your journey into this whole thing and becoming a singer, performer, collaborator, educator? Um, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, how this all began. Definitely. Um, so I was raised in Davis, California, um, and played in the Sacramento Youth Orchestra, Youth Symphony, starting when I was eight. Um, I grew up playing the violin. Um, my mom's side of the family um, is Italian American, and and they were based on the East Coast. But my dad's side of the family has actually been in California for like six generations, and. Mm -hmm. um, he partially grew up on a houseboat on the Sacramento River, and um, <laughs> my grandfather taught at Sac State, and um, so my family connections to the area um, are run long and deep. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, I, I grew up always with an interest in music, um, but never with any designs f towards being a professional. It just seemed impractical and it would be it would be like me being a basketball star or something like that i just never imagined that it ever could have really been possible um and and i think the other part of that was that i really wanted to do something with my life that you know made a difference in the world and i loved music more than pretty much anything but it just i was like well i should do something like you know be a doctor and and save people's lives and and that's that's how I'm going to, you know, give back uh -huh. in this world. Um, but I was sort of hoodwinked into joining the Davis Children's Chorale uh -huh. by um, the director, Rachel Kessler, who told me that she changed the rehearsal time of the ensemble just so that I could join it because I had told her it conflicted with my youth orchestra, you know, Sacramento Youth Symphony um, rehearsals. And I, I was like, I had no interest in joining this chorus, but um, she said she changed the rehearsal time just for me. And so I felt really guilty. And so <laughs> I joined the chorus and I soon realized that it was actually really the highlight of my week and oh, I just wonderful. loved singing. And I'm incredibly indebted to Rachel Kessler for um, believing in me and investing in me and giving me lessons for free when I was, you know, I was still studying the violin, and so it was expensive for my family to try to have lessons in multiple instruments. Um, and yeah, and encouraging me to go on in music. Um, so I started taking lessons when I was in high school, private lessons when I was in ninth grade, the second half of ninth grade. Mm -hmm. um, but I still really had no professional aspirations. And it wasn't really until I was in college, about halfway through college, and again, thanks to really thanks to the encouragement and generosity and support of um, my professors, that I started to think, well, maybe there is something here. And <laughs> moreover, singing in general is just so fascinating. This marriage of text and music and drama and history and being able to tell stories and being able to transport people and being able to mm -hmm. move people. And it's not because I'm such a great singer. It's because we all need storytelling in a part of, in our lives. You know, I think in the pandemic, we have seen the diversity of what an essential worker is that, that people, we need people doing all different kinds of jobs mm -hmm. in order to make society function. And some of those jobs are those fancy six figure important jobs. And some of those jobs are even more vitally important and not um, the, the compensation for those jobs is not, is not equal. Correct, right. 
But music, I think, we have also seen is vitally important. Music saved my life. Music saves lives. Music changes yes. lives. And we need in music, therefore, a diversity of people and voices, both literal and figurative, mm. um, to be a part of that conversation and a part of that storytelling. Um, Beautiful. Yes, yeah. no, I, I love yeah, that. My I mom teaches at CRC. There you go. <laughs> she teaches in the art department, correct? Yes. Sculpture, yes. So um, incredible connections. Uh, we're so grateful to have you back here and to have, have you coming through here. We, we're, we were going to try to get you on campus, uh, but of course we're still just coming out of this zone. So maybe next year or something like that, uh, particularly if our audience demands it, uh, perhaps you'll come back and uh, perform for us live and we can get some more of those collaborative conversations going. Going. Um, I wanted to get into some more music and more singing of yours. Um, we have some Brahms here next. Can you tell us a little bit about this performance of Sintes Schmerzen, Sintes Freuden? Sure. So I picked this piece. Uh, this is from a performance in December of this year um, because you know, I've been thinking a lot about you know, how do how do I even wind up doing the things that I'm doing? All of these this you know different kind of variety of music. And this is an example of um, an, uh, a, a period where a presenting organization asked me to sing this particular piece. And mm -hmm. I liked working with this performing organization before. And I thought, well, I don't really know if this is the right repertoire for me, but let me look at it and think about it. And um, this song comes from a larger song cycle by Brahms, Die Schöne Magalona, which is interspersed with narration and music. And um, it is traditionally, or it seems in recent years, to um, be performed most often by mezzos or baritones, often in transposition. But this was an opportunity to perform the piece in its original key, and it, as you'll hear, with an 1857 piano by Johann Streicher. So this is actually the same kind of piano that Brahms was using when he was composing this piece. And the construction of the instrument is a little bit different from a modern piano. So you'll hear kind of right off of the bat that the sound is not exactly the same as a modern Steinway, even though it looks more or less <laughs> like a piano shaped object. Um, <laughs> and because the instrument is a little bit lighter, it made it more comfortable for me to mm -hmm. sing this hour long it, it's an hour of music plus about 30 minutes of narration so it's a big project but it's a really interesting uh, piece and i wanted to give you an example of one kind of historically informed performance fantastic let's take a listen to this brahms sind es schmerzen sind es freuden
<laughs> and there's more. <laughs> Wonderful. Absolutely lovely. You're, you're such an, a, an expressive singer. I really like um, the sort of visual world that you create and sort of the, I always call it sort of the disappearance of the performer and sort of the arrival of the artist. And you sort of sort of disappear before us and then we see you in another place. And I just think it's fantastic how um, how you were able to create that world. Where was this recorded? So this is at the Harvard Musical Association in Boston. Uh, they have a beautiful little hall. And um, we were very lucky that when we offered them this option of bringing in this 1857 instrument, they were game. So um, <laughs> we actually had professional moving crews on either side pack up the piano from Ithaca. It's an instrument that we borrowed from the Cornell's from Cornell's collection of historical keyboards. And then mm -hmm. we drove the U-Haul ourselves to Boston, <laughs> which was so nerve wracking. And then <laughs> a, a professional crew unloaded it on the other end. I just was like, 
having heart palpitations <laughs> like course. eight hours. Um, but thankfully, everything <laughs> went okay and it survived that, the journey in both directions. That's amazing. No, oh, the things we do for art. That's that's pretty extraordinary. Um, no, it was a beautiful setting and just looks, it just seems so appropriate. I love the, the old music stand and everything there just sort of transported us. It's really just sort of attention to details like that are really, um, they help they help us they help your audience really sort of go with you to these in, incredible places forgotten places places that we you know wouldn't necessarily even know culturally just how they would have existed in history so we talked a little bit about this but you seem to curate your programming um uh, maybe not just i guess you sort of said something to the line, you know, sort of you're open to the experience and the possibility, but it seems that you're curating or choosing these ideas, um, choosing these, this repertoire as you move through the world as an artist. Um, and you also mentioned that you weren't sure that this piece was, uh, was right for you. Can you talk a little bit about how you are um, continuing to find pieces that inspire you um, collaboration projects and how you balance that with whether or not you think it's right for you. you know, I've got students who are like, I want to sing Ness and Dorma. I'm like, oh, but you're like a, you're a bass and you just started yesterday. So I don't think that's going to happen just yet, but, but I really appreciate your interest in this really gorgeous music. So how do you approach that when you're thinking about repertoire, new things? Yeah. And trying to figure out if something is a, is a project that's going to help you stretch and grow and learn more about your instrument or learn more about um, another culture or another composer, or if it's just really not something that you should be working on is a long personal process. Um, and you know, when I, I perform a lot of new pieces and um, some of that music is sometimes music that really asks me to do um, extreme things with my voice and mm it sometimes can be a hard, a hard decision, you know, it, um, this piece that I just performed, uh, premiered of Catherine Balch's a few weeks ago, um, has some really difficult aspects to it technically. Um, and so when I'm learning a piece or looking at a new score from a composer or discovering a new piece in the library, you know, there are things that I know about how my voice works. Um, what is the balance going to be like in this part of my range with the instruments with whom I'm performing. So mm. it's not just like, can I sing these pitches, but is this really sitting in the middle of my voice while the orchestra is playing really loudly? Maybe this isn't going to be <laughs> a great fit for me, even if I can sing all of the notes comfortably. Yeah. Or, wow, this piece really sits in a, the high part of my range for a really long time on a lot of text. Um, do I need to have a conversation with the composer about maybe just moving some of the text around so that I can feel sure that I'm able to communicate the text in a way that the audience will be able to understand it and sing it in a way that feels comfortable for my body? Um, I hope that people just heard what you just said. You just said talking to the composer about making adjustments. Now, that is a real thing. That's not I mean, if we give you some old 24 Italian, that's not going to happen. You can't talk to the composer. Right, so, you, but my, the seances <laughs> don't really pan out. <laughs> they don't usually work out so well. But uh, but this notion of communicating, uh, not only having a really good understanding of yourself, this sounds like you have to have a good sense of musicianship. you got to be able to look at the score and look at the notes and things, but also not just your part, the piano part, the orchestration, etc. So I'm, I'm saying these things for my listen uh, singers out there listening and uh, et cetera, et cetera, that there's so much more to be looking at and balancing in terms of what you decide for your repertoire and what you'll champion. So, wow, that's, I love that. I love that. I, but I interrupted you. I wasn't sure if you wanted to say more. Oh, well, I guess maybe, you know, the, the hard part is trying to decide, you know, I never want to come into a conversation with a composer saying you made the wrong choice, mm. um, but I do want to come into a conversation saying, you know, this might be difficult for me to get the text across in the way that I'm envisioning being able to communicate with the audience. Can you tell me why you made these choices? Mm. Or can you help me understand how I can better communicate this? And it might just be that the composer um, 
didn't realize that like that consonant cluster at that pitch was going to be really hard to say and they're really open to making changes or it might be that they have a kind of different goal in mind it might be that you're not the right fit for that project and but i think making sure that it comes from a place of um openness and willingness to experiment and collaborate with the composer on the performer side makes those conversations interesting and fun and um, easy to have and not scary and feeling like either you're not worthy as a performer or that the composer hasn't taken your instrument into consideration. Mm, um, yes. These are important things to consider. Absolutely. No, I love that. I was just have, I was thinking flashbacks of a friend who was doing some Yana check and it was like, oh, how do you sing all? There was like six, there were like six con consonant clusters together on this high note. I don't, how do you get that out? Right. Yeah. Sort of understanding, <laughs> understanding what was needed. Maybe they wanted it to sound difficult. Maybe they wanted to you know, right. feel or appear that way. Yeah, and so, you know, definitely. Great. I, I love that. So um, you you said something earlier, uh, I think before we started our video today, um, a phrase that I absolutely think is a gorgeous, gorgeous phrase, and it's the myth of absence when it comes to repertoire and those um, voices that want to be heard in the recital programs, on the concert stage, the symphonic orchestras, et cetera. And you have embarked upon, I mean, you already, you're sharing Florence Price, Margaret Thons, all these interesting things, forgotten pieces, you know, obscure Baroque things, et cetera. Um, there's so much music out there. And yet there is room for more and more voices, more interesting things. Can you tell us about some of the ongoing work that you're doing in this realm, particularly um, Sparks and Wiry Cries? Um, tell us a little bit about what that is, uh, what that means, what what is that project? Yeah, so um, I, in addition to my teaching work and my performance work, I also do some arts administrative work and I am the managing editor for an art song organization called Sparks and Why We Cries. It's a um, quote from a Paul Goodman poem. And um, this organization is, I, I love working for this small women-led organization because its goals are my goals insofar as it believes that art song is a way for us to communicate with our communities and art song has a place and a need for all of our voices. And so what we do kind of, um, well, we, we have like three main arms, um, a triskelion if you were, if you will. So um, we're very invested in the creation of new pieces. Um, we run a competition called the Song Slam, which is modeled after a kind of poetry slam or events like the Moth, where we bring in with as little of a barrier as possible, uh, composer, performer, sometimes poet teams uh, to premiere new works. And the competitions are designed to be um, audience choice voting. So oh, wow. um, we ask, you know, we try to bring in a big audience of people to help support the performers and um, we allow them to decide, you know, put the responsibility in their hands. Listen to this music. What moves you as an audience member? What is exciting to you in these performances? Mm. Um, and then we as an organization also pay close attention to those performers and will um, commission works or publish works. Um, we have an agreement with New Music Shelf to publish some of these pieces, which allows the composers to retain ownership over the music, but gives them more of a um, ability to share with a broader public. So we have the Song Slam arm. We produce a, a festival in New York City. Um, and I'm really excited about the project that we have coming up um, in 2023. So this is something that we've been working on. It'll be literally years in the making. But uh -huh. um, we have partnered with a number of really amazing artists, I think some of whom have been guests actually on this series before. Oh, really? Karen Slack, <laughs> right? Didn't Karen yes, give Karen was our first, first guest of our series. Um, amazing. So, um, kind of in, inspired by the work of a 
co colleague at Cornell, the historian Edward Baptist, who created a database of fugitive slave advertisements, digitized fugitive slave advertisements. Um, and looking at the number of musicians, especially, who were able to use their contact with the musical world to help pave their paths to freedom, um, we commissioned an incredible poet and an incredible composer to work together to create a song cycle that will be performed by Karen Slack, Reggie Modley, and William Liver Will Liverman, um, mm -hmm. along with pianist Howard Watkins, and interspersed with music performed and created by Rhiannon Giddens. And so uh, this project is going to premiere at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in January of 23, and then go on to performances in Philadelphia, and actually ultimately in the season after that wind up, um, the plan is to have a performance at the church where Harriet Tubman worshiped in Auburn, New York. Um, and so it's been a real privilege to just be a part of getting the money and the, yes. um, and and making things possible for the artists. The music is by Shauna Pueblo, who's um, a gorgeous uh, composer, um, really beautiful songs. Will Liverman recorded some of them. Um, and poetry, uh, both by and curated by Elitsitsi Jaji, who is a uh, professor at Duke University. And um, yeah, just um, being a part of helping to make projects like this happen is um, a big privilege. I am just salivating. <laughs> all the things you said, I was like, oh yes, all of that, all all of those things. I just, I want, the, I want performances out here. I want that story out here. It just, it sounds so credible, incredible. And I love the nexus points of um, history and various musical styles, right? Not just, I mean, for those of you who don't know, Rhiannon Giddens is um, a singer, uh, artist, uh, 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 is it banjo and other kind of lute-like instruments um, and was a part of the is it Louisiana Honey Drop? What was the what was the name of uh, the, the, the uh, Carolina uh, Chocolate Drops? Carolina Chocolate Drops. That Carolina and Chocolate Drops. She's Drops. actually now the um, artistic director of the Silk Road Ensemble. So she took over from Yo Yo Ma, and her early musical background was in classical voice. Mm -hmm. um, and um, actually, her husband is an early music person. Um, and so listening to them talk about the intersection of early music and jazz um, is yes. really, really exciting. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, we are, we are really excited about the ways in which this project, as you said, um, creates a sort of synchronicity between all of these different areas and doesn't separate separate out different musical styles. Mm -hmm. um, is that a thing for you? I know a lot of organizations now, like for instance, um, in uh, at the collegiate level, there there are less and less barriers between musical theater and opera. For instance, sometimes they just like if you're singing, you're singing, acting. We're gonna teach you all together, and you know whatever you're singing is whatever you're singing. But in terms of the art form, the goals are essentially the same. Um, so we're gonna start teaching you differently. Do you, do you see, um, as an educator yourself, do you see these nexus points maybe making their way to the classroom? Um, uh, how much um, agency do students have in finding that kind of these nexus points for themselves? That's a great question. So, yes, um, I, my musical background is, was from my early childhood, always very strongly classically influenced. And so mm -hmm. for me, that is the music that feels like my native tongue. But that is not necessarily the same for every person. And I think that we create these false divisions between musical expressivity. We are my my body and your body and uh, Adele's body and, uh, you know, whoever's body. It's not like we're, we have different kinds of you know we're made the same way um and and so while we may use our instruments differently in these different musical styles we're still dealing with the same kind of instrument and i think you know when i where i teach at cornell 
the students that I have in my studio tend to be the students that are more classically oriented because I feel like that's that's what I know more about. And so I want to teach students the things that I know about, but of yes. uh, the teachers that, um, so I'm the director of the voice program there. And um, we, there are seven of us that teach voice and we all have very different backgrounds. We have an amazing bass who sings at the Met. Um, we have a singer songwriter who whose early training was in classical music, but who like definitely doesn't sing that music anymore. Um, mm -hmm. And I think having this range of different kinds of teachers and an openness to musical styles in our end of year, end of semester recitals, it is like Billie Eilish and Henry Purcell and Florence Price and Margaret Bonds. And, you know, we all learn from each other yeah. when, when we are making music together. Yeah. Um, so. Yeah, that changes a lot of the conversation about um, in this sort of what's serious music, you know, what's serious singing and what's, you know, um, what can be trained and what's just sort of you just fell out of bed doing and whether there's value in you coming with your natural talent to, to express yourself vocally in whatever kind of music that's out there or music that you enjoy singing. So um, I, I think that's incredible. I, I think that we've got some some uh, questions here about uh, whether or not you, um, if you could talk about your teaching and I, um, uh, your teaching career. Um, but before we get too far, because I want to make sure that uh, we get a little chance to hear the other pieces that you've offered, um, I'd love to hear this next piece, um, Joel Engel piece. Can you tell us about it? And then we'll circle back with some of the other questions we've got. Yeah, so one of the, things that the pandemic afforded me was a lot of time with my husband, Ryan, which was awesome. <laughs> um, and um, we were asked by YIVO, the Institute for Jew Jewish Research in New York City, to um, start recording some music by in Yiddish by composers, um, both um, of Eastern European extraction and then also um, some contemporary compositions that are recontextualizing Yiddish folk song. And so this is from a recording of 20 songs by Joel Engel, who was really the first um, composer to start making um, settings of Yiddish folk song in a classical idiom. And mm -hmm. this is um, a recording of a song that has piano and voice and a violin obligato. Um, I was really lucky to have the opportunity to work with a 95 year old cantor on my Yiddish diction over FaceTime. Um, and to really sync myself in this repertoire, it's also about an hour's worth of music. Um, if you listen to the whole thing, uh, we'll just hear one of the songs. Um, and it's about, like many folk songs, it's a song about um, love and a little bit of betrayal. Fantastic. Let's take a listen to this piece by Joel Engel. Oh, my God. 
One can feel it. Oh, it's just gorgeous and so moving. Thank you for sharing that video. One of uh, our questions is from our uh, dean here, actually, um, acting about uh, asking about your acting um, and about um, how we connect as singers to the text in ways, um, uh, of course, vocally of course just that but also in terms of just the physical expression i talked a little bit more about how you disappear and the character appears um can you talk about um training or how you might approach that with your students in terms of helping them to um tap into uh, the acting part of uh, of any storytelling they're doing in songs when i was growing up as a violinist i had really bad stage fright and mm. it was really interesting to me that in singing it felt like I didn't have that same anxiety and a big part of it for me I think is just feeling like it's not about me it's about the story that I'm telling and I um you know it was like in my public school musicals when I was growing up and so I did a little bit of acting and and that sort of context and I did um I don't know if anybody here has done Destination Imagination or Odyssey of the Mind. Um, but I did a bunch of like weird problem solving acting stuff as a kid also. Um, and then when I was in college um, and then more in graduate school, took some um, acting courses that were specifically for sort of how to act in opera and to know about how to use your body um, in a way that also allows you to connect with the audience or how to connect with other people on stage without um, turning your face away from the audience and stuff like that. So kind of craft in that sense. But I think for me, um, as you noted, it really comes from the text and the story that I'm trying to tell. Um, you know, what I love about this genre of music is that generally the text came first. Um, so the composer, she saw a poem that moved her and it made her hear music and mm -hmm. she created a piece of music based on that text and so my first point of contact has to be the text that's where the music is coming from the poetry has its own inherent meter and rhythm and pitch content and the text that were the language itself has its own characteristic yiddish is a very different language um from italian or from french um it has a lot of similarities with german but it, it also has um very distinctive qualities to it and that brings its own sort of musical musicality and expressivity to the to the language itself um and so i feel like my job as a performer is yes to make sounds that are beautiful and or at least hopefully not ugly um but more than that, it is to make a story happen. Storytelling is such a, an important part of human culture. Yeah. And whatever context that happens to be in, in my case, with, with some sort of musical element to it, 
it's about transporting us. It's about allowing us to connect with our own memories and our own experiences. You know, most of the time, none of us have really lived through exactly what's happening in these in these poems, but we have all experienced some part of this um, small glimpse of humanity. Yeah. And so performance allows us to share that with each other, to experience joy together and to mourn together. And both of those things are equally important. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. Absolutely beautiful. You talk about um, connecting with um, the audience or, you know, sort of on, on, on certain levels through the music. Um, but you also have this really wonderful concept about um, connecting with your fellow artists, your fellow um, just human, not even just an artistry. Of course, you do this with Sparks and Wiry Cries, this idea of his sort of historical narrative, etc. Can you talk about the term that you use sort of ecosystems, a sort of artistic ecosystem versus this idea of networking and sort of transactional nature of that? Can you tell us a little bit more about this concept, um, how we might be able to think of that in our own journeys through music and art? Yeah, the word networking is just so capitalist. And, <laughs> and I think it can turn off a lot of us, particularly those of us who aren't really drawn to behave that way or to see music in a really transactional way. Um, and so I prefer to think about it more like building and enriching an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. You know, I, one of the reasons why I love singing is that all of our voices are different. Everybody on this Zoom call can sing everybody has a voice and all of our voices are equally important because all of us have had different life experiences that change the way that we inflect our storytelling and so the way that i tell a story may connect with some people but the way that you tell a story is going to connect with people in a different way and we can tell the same story and tell different stories at the same time and both yes. of those are really valuable when we try to each fight over our own slice of the pie, all we wind up with is like a tiny pie, a tiny piece of pie. <laughs> but if we think about music making in our musical community, like that stone soup story, where right. everybody brings what they are best at to the table, then all of a sudden we have a feast. We, there is room for all of us in this industry. And our job is to figure out how we, what our best talents are and how we can most contribute and make a difference and our uniqueness, because that is going to be valuable and necessary to somebody in our audience. Um, and the more that we work together to bring in a bigger community, to bring in those grant monies, to um, reach wider and more diverse audiences, then the more fun, the more meaning, the more impact we can have with our music making together. Um, yes. I feel like, yeah, there, what is the point of squabbling over a <laughs> tiny piece of pie when we can have a feast together? Right. So it's, it's funny because uh, I, um, I have a really big problem with music and art competitions in general like I, I have a big problem with them um like choral competitions and things like that because you know for the very reasons that you just mentioned and um john baptiste just won uh, best album of the year or whatever award for the grammys and um for those who don't know john baptiste is a, a musician pianist um uh, composer and um and personality he of course uh, is the uh, the music team leader on uh, the, Steve, the Stephen Colbert TV show. They, what's that called? I don't know the name of the television show. Anyway, the nightly, whatever, something. He's an evening show. Uh, but he's the music director of that program as well. And in his acceptance speech, he sort of said, there, there really is no such thing as the best artist. He just does the work. You do the work and there's room for everyone. He admired everyone who was nominated. He was very thrilled by it. But that kind of concept goes through to these you know, sort of singing competitions on television. Um, you know, whereby we pit these really incredible artists, all of them are wonderful young singers against one another, 
and then sort of like, what? Well, there's really there's room for all of them. I kind of feel like they should just say like, you are our winners. <laughs> now let's play with what you can do for the next season and, you know, and then create some wonderful albums and concerts and things like that. Um, but I think also in what you're saying, there seems to be a way in which we can have um, a sort of worldwide ecosystem that grows, but also these smaller regional areas or c college ecosystems, things like that, whereby um, students can work with one another across different areas. Do you have that going on in your school at how, or how does that work in your own immediate community? Yeah, so, I mean, I guess I think about this on kind of all levels of my career and all of the different kind of work that I do. Sparks and Ryrie Cries also really believes in this too, right? We don't feel like we need to be the only art song organization out there. We want to be somebody who helps connect and bring people together. Um, one of my, so I mentioned earlier in the hour, uh, this concert that my students gave on International Women's Day, celebrating different women composers throughout a large swath of history. And one of my favorite things about this performance was that I was able to bring together the piano studios and the voice studio. So not just mm -hmm. my students, but the students throughout the voice program and the students who are studying piano at Cornell to work together, because that is so much more fun when you get to <laughs> collaborate with somebody. Um, <laughs> Right. And it gave the pianist a chance to experience, um, you know, the, the act of working with text. And um, also half of the music on that program was performed in an 1823 Conrad Graf Forte piano. So a chance for them to explore working with historical instruments. Mm. Um, but yes, the more that we can bring people together from across campus, from across disciplines, many of my students at Cornell are not music majors, they're computer science majors, or um, linguistics majors, or right. English majors. Um, and so what I love about music is that, and especially about vocal music and working with text, is that it really, you know, I talk to my computer science majors about how the score is programming. And so we can look at the code of the score and interpret that code. And we can also understand how the code mm -hmm. may be asking our body to do things kind of subconsciously that are not helpful to performance that we haven't necessarily thought about because we didn't interrogate the ways in which there may be sort of bugs in the code or the, the way that the, the code is interpreted by mm -hmm. our body isn't necessarily helping us in the best way to make the sound at that moment. Wow. Or um, for, with my linguistic students, like what are you learning in linguistics and how can we talk about the diction in this piece in the way that's related to, to sound? Or um, how can we look at, let's analyze this poem together. Let's look at how Fanny Mendelssohn took the structure of this two strophe poem and created something that was not in um, an equal binary uh, with two different parts. It actually has, she sort of repeats the first half of the po poem twice and then has the last part of the poem. Um, why do you think she made these choices? Mm -hmm. And how does that inform your interpretation and performance of the piece? Um, yeah, I, I guess love it. It's a, it's it an all it's, works together. Yeah. yeah, it works together. And, and each of the, e there's all this working together, but each of the members of this ecosystem or part part of people who are part of it get to sort of become more deeply enmeshed in it more immersed in it because they have an equal contribution to the whole thing right they get to participate in it they understand that they are worthy and and i think that that um all of a sudden somehow amplifies their own voice and maybe their investment in the in the music making and the storytelling and all of those different things so um i think it's absolutely wonderful um how add, oh, no go ahead please i just want to add one last thing about this kind of ecosystem idea which is that and this is related to competitions we mm -hmm. have this notion in music that somehow we're gonna have our one like make or break it event <laughs> that will catapult us to success and fame and mm -hmm. it's been really interesting to me to f to often find that the opportunities that I think are my biggest opportunities sometimes don't directly seem to lead into anything. And those little tiny steps along the way, those somehow become the enriching yes. events. And it's so easy for us to, um, to not 
prioritize the things that seem like, you know, oh, I'm performing at Carnegie Hall, and so that's going to be the really big event. Um, and, and not to prioritize the sort of smaller opportunities for us to really engage with an audience or mm. sing at a nursing home and really bring a piece of music that means something to somebody, which is not to say yeah. that the people at Carnegie Hall don't deserve to hear our music either. Right, right, but um, I think that is, it's, it's connected to this idea of enriching the ecosystem and, and treating everything like it's an important part yes. of sharing our music and our humanity with other people. I love that. And I, I think that you, 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 you touch on how we go through these things for ourselves as, a, as artists, growing artists, artists in training, students, et cetera, but also sort of arriving at an understanding of what we need out of this ecosystem versus what, the, what others, maybe not even in the ecosystem, sort of think we should be doing or what have you. Yeah, they, they see the shiny, flashy thing. Oh, you've done so-and-so, but that may not be the most fulfilling thing for you. Maybe it is that small thing. I love collaborative new works. Reading a new score, no one else has touched it. That makes me so excited. I love that so much more than, oh, you're singing a famous thing here or, or, or there. Um, being, I feel like so much closer to it when it's in that, that spot. So, and I, I, I'm also hoping that our students are hearing these wonderful inspirational words and that you have the ability right now to make those experiences happen and to begin building on more and more of them. I always say to the students, you are the future of the industry. So get cracking. Start working on these things. Um, as we come to a close, we're coming near our time. We're just past the hour. Um, I wanted to um, ask you one more thing and to share um, a little bit more about, um, to share another piece of music as well. Um, and it has to do with um, simply really about, about how you are moving next in this world. We are, um, like we said, we're coming out of pandemic. Uh, you said you have a really, really busy, wild schedule coming on. Um, is there anything that you want to see um, happening next for you in, the, in, in your career, in um, any interesting things you have on the horizon that we should be on the lookout for? Um, what's up next? Oh, well, I have a lot of different projects coming up in the next um, year, and I'm excited about all of them. One of them that is particularly exciting um, to me is I'll be giving a recital for the Philadelphia Chamber Music Society, and mm -hmm. that is going to include some music by some of my favorite composers. Um, Adela Madison, who was an incredible uh, turn of the century British um, queer composer who wrote incredibly beautiful music, uh, but also some songs by um, the Davis-based composer Pablo Ortiz, who's an Argentine-American composer. Um, and Ryan and I are gonna be recording some of those songs. Um, so uh, that's one project that I'm really excited about. Um, some more pieces that were canceled during the pandemic that are still very slowly coming back, um, but included amongst them. One of my most favorite pieces, um, Earl Kim's Where Grief Slumbers. Earl Kim was an American, uh, Korean American composer and his centenary was in 2020, but unfortunately because of COVID, I think we missed out on a chance to um, engage with his music the way we should have. Um, and. Mm. So I'm really looking forward to, after like four reschedules, finally getting to perform that piece. Um, Wonderful. Yeah, lots of different things. Great, well, I did put uh, your website in the chat and I hope that people will follow you and to find out what's going on um, with you in the future here. Can you tell us um, about this, uh, this next piece, this Margaret Bonds piece, Women Have Loved Before? Yeah. So um, Margaret Bonds wrote six settings of poetry by the American uh, poet Edna St. Vincent Millay, who is also a resident of the Hudson Valley, where I now live. And um, these six songs are really beautiful, really interesting. Um, they were recently published, uh, so now you can finally find the music. Um, Women Have Loved Before, for me, and St. Vincent Millay was a, had um, a life that was difficult 
things did not come easily her way. And I feel like this is a big part of why Bonds really gravitated towards her poetry. I think Bonds also had so many different kinds of struggles in her life. Mm -hmm. um, and what I love about this poem is that in it, I'm talking about how women have had these huge experiences, have fallen in love, have made mistakes. Um, but I can't find anyone alive who has had this experience. And so in the poem, I'm turning to the heroines of ancient Greece and Rome. And what I love about Margaret Bonds and Millet and all of us interpreting and reinterpreting music, this kind of path, this stream of music throughout and literature throughout history is that all of us are able to kind of connect with that idea. Um, so this is a recording from uh, January of this year in um, honor of Margaret Bonds Day, January 31st. Um, and... Wonderful. So yeah. let's take a listen to this piece, Women Have Loved Before by, by Margaret Bonds. Chronicles of the past Of Irish waters by a Cornish prow Or Trojan waters by a Spartan mast Much to their cost in vain Here and there Hunting the amorous line Skimming the road just sigh after your performance is fantastic another lovely lovely performance thank you so so very much um i i, I don't have any more um questions for you um but i did want to um leave it open to you if you had anything else you wanted to share with us our students particularly if you um I wish to send them out with any kind of challenge um, and how they might move forward in uh, their performances, how they might collaborate, how, how they might think about art, any charge, any thought that you might have, I would love for you to um, share a thought um, as we close today. You know, that's it. It feels like a really big, really big challenge to me. So, so I apologize if I if I fall short. But you know, one thing that I, I think there's so much we can all feel, or maybe this is just me, but it, um, I think it's really easy to feel like, you know, am I am I worthy or am I adequate? Um, particularly because, um, not just students, but all of us, we're all continuing to learn and all trying to continue to improve our craft. Um, and one thing that I tell my students is that we just, you just never know who needs to hear what you have to say. And it, not everyone is going to love what you do, 
which is totally fine because you probably don't love everything that everyone does either. And what our job is, is to reach the person who needs to hear what we have to say. And mm -hmm. those people are out there. Um, those people are waiting for you to say what you have to say. So stay true to yourself and stay true to what you need as a human and an artist, and you will connect with those people who need you too. See, I knew you could do that. That was wonderful, incredible, exactly what I think so many of our students needed to hear. Thank you so much, Lucy. What a pleasure and honor it is to have you here and to just share with you. I could sit and talk with you for hours and hopefully someday we will get a chance to do that. Um, I want to thank our audience for joining us today. I hope you've been inspired with the wise and exciting, wonderful words of our great guest, uh, soprano Lucy Fitzgibbon. Thank you so much, Lucy, toy, toy, toy for tonight and best wishes for your future season. Uh, we can't wait to have you here on our campus at CRC. Um, for those of you here uh, in the area or visiting from anywhere afar, that's fine. Next week, we're on spring break here at CRC. So we will be back the following week with another CRC Music in the Studio with violinist Chase Spruill on April 22nd and composer, pianist uh, Graham Sobelman on April 29th. So, uh, uh, we hope to see you at those events um, and we hope that you have a great spring break next week. Those of you who are getting a, a chance to take a little time off. Thank you again, Lucy. And so that's all. <laughs> Thank you. Oh my gosh. We're so thrilled. Thank you. <laughs> take care. Bye-bye everyone.